Welcome, everybody, to the Competition Archery Media Podcast, where we explore all things pertaining to competition archery. I'm your host, PJ Riley, and our CAM podcast is brought to you by O'Neill's Classic Archery. So today we have with us now what I'm calling the undisputed national outdoor target champion off three big wins. We'll talk about Jimmy Lutz. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys for having me. <laughs> so Jimmy, the, the titles we're talking about are USA Archery Outdoor Target Champion, US Open Champion, and now NFA Outdoor Target Champion. You won all three. Yep, I'm having a pretty good run right now. <laughs> Have you ever done that before? Um, I don't think all in the same year, no. All in the um, same year. I, I know this is either the second or third time I've won the NFA outdoor, but um, uh, I don't think I've done them in the same year. Gotcha. What What do you think's clicking right now? Just a good run or what's happening? I mean, I, I feel like I'm shooting good, obviously. Um, I, the bow is just it's hitting where I'm aiming, which is all I can ask for, um, with the style of shooting that I do. Um, it, everything's kind of clicking together, but it doesn't seem like it's just a hot streak. You know, I feel like this is just how I'm shooting and, yeah. and hopefully I can continue that for a, a long, a long time. So we should mention mixed in with that besides those three championships is a new world record a world yep. record where you broke your own world record. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. They, we had, we had some pretty good conditions in, uh, in Pennsylvania, um, with, with those double 72 arrow, uh, records, you know, it's, it takes two really good days to, to beat. Um, and really I, I don't have my mind set on that when I'm going into the event, Right. but when my last, three ends, 18 arrows or whatnot. I mean, I definitely started thinking about it, but um, luckily I was able to just keep my head down and, and keep focusing. So that was at uh, USA Archery Target Nationals. And as we're saying uh, for that round, it's a called the two by 72. That's what it is in world archery. Um, there's another one. There is a 1440 round, but that's not what this is. It's two by 72. And you shot a 1424, I believe. Yep. Yeah, that was, yes, and your old record was 1422. Yep. Yep. And they were both shot at that same event. Yeah. Um, just yeah. Two, two years apart. Um, so perfect would have been 1440 uh, in that event there. I mean, dropping 16 points, that's not too bad over the course of 144 arrows. Right. It, if, for some reason, 16 points seems like a lot, but that's really not that much when you're looking at it. No. 50 meters and, and outdoors conditions. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you're shooting for Darton. I know that was one of the things that we wanted to talk about, you know, Darton, it seems like now the traction is gaining, you know, you're shooting Darton. We've got Jacob Slusars who, uh, just won an ASA. Uh, that was the one in London. No. Oh, uh, Metropolis. Yeah, Metropolis. Metropolis. He won. And he's the first one in open pro not named McCarthy or Morgan to win in I don't know how many years. Uh, then there's Joseph Goza shooting Darton as well. I mean, you guys, he's got a couple podium finishes, IBO, ASA. It just seems like Darton is, you know, that that prestige is coming back. Right. And that's, I mean, that's what we were going for. Um, when, when Randy Kitts bought the company, he really f at first focused on just, just the product, you know, we need to get the product as good as everybody else's. And I mean, in way shorter time than I expected. And I think than anybody expected, I mean, he went above and beyond. Um, yeah. I, I get away with so much stuff with this Tempest D3D. Um, as far as, as just a bow platform, it's the most stable thing I've ever shot. Um, and I mean, obviously with, uh, Joseph and Jacob and even my wife, Danelle, she want right. to want to, uh, you sat this year. I mean, we're, we're proving that it's, it's as good as shooting as we say. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I've seen a, a podium recently without one of us on the podium. Um, and I mean, we're just, everything just keeps getting better and going and looking forward um, to the future. So yeah. uh, whatever, whatever Randy and, and those Darton guys up there in Michigan have, have gotten into is, is for sure working. <laughs> And I know you and I had talked about it. You have, you gave Randy input on some of the bows and I know the first Spectra E he brought to me, 
to uh, do a review on and I, you know, called him up. I was like, ah, Randy, I can't do a review on this bow, man. This thing vibrates like all get out. And I just didn't like the way it shot. And I think it was the next year I saw him at Metropolis and he said, hey, come over here. He said, remember that bow you hated last year? He's like, shoot it now. And I mean, they changed the aluminum, the limb angles. They changed a lot of stuff and it was like night and day. Now, all of a sudden it shot as good as any of the you know hunting bows flagship hunting bows out there and i believe you had a similar experience with some of the target stuff right i got the first tempest uh late 2020 i think or maybe early 2021 i I can't really remember now but and i brought it to gator cup i got it like a week before gator cup and it was exactly kind of what you were saying it just vibrated like crazy um it was it felt just very weak uh when i was shooting it like there was no muscle behind the bow um and within i think two months i got this brand new prototype riser um a mile better Um, and then maybe a month after that he sent me the prototype to this which is what we have now and it was even better than that, which I didn't, I mean, that, that proto first prototype bow shot great. Um, I didn't think that he could make it better, any better than that. Right. Um, but this, this new Tempest and the Vegas platforms for the target bows is, I mean, they just absolutely hit the money with that. It's, it's extremely forgiving, extremely stable. Um, and it's a mile different from what the, the first bow I got was. <laughs> which one are you shooting again? It's the 36? This is the, yeah, the Tempest E3D. Um, okay. I'm going to be playing around with the ET for uh, indoors. I shot the ET a little bit last year. Um, it shot it shot great for me, but I actually made a little form change, so I think I'm going to go back to the ET. It'll just fit me fit my face a little bit better. Right, right. Uh, for any younger listeners out there who may be new to Darton, you know, people my age, we all remember Darton because <laughs> through the 80s and 90s, if you were in bow hunting, you knew about Darton. I mean, they were that was a big name. That was one of the big brands. And it just kind of fell off a little bit, um, you know, as the, we turned from the 90s into the 2000s. Uh, it wasn't, you know, one of the upper tier brands. And then, as you mentioned, Randy Kitts just bought it a couple years ago, and now he wants to turn things around there. So good things coming from dart in there it's it's exciting to see that to see a new one especially with randy i mean from black eagle he's a great guy in conquest um, absolutely just a great person in archery um so but to your accomplishments now let's go back uh first to the usa archery national championship because that was the first uh first one you won there Tell me about that weekend. I mean, it was a new field. Uh, you were in a particularly favorable spot on that field. <laughs> yeah. Uh, usually when we go to new fields, which happens every couple years, I feel like with that event, um, it started in Ohio and then went to Virginia and now Pennsylvania. Um, you, you never know what to expect the first year there. Um, we got there. The practice day was pretty windy, if I can remember yeah, correctly. It was. Um, I didn't even I shot three arrows i think the practice day because we just drove like six hours danelle wanted to get some arrows in and i'm like i'm tired <laughs> i just want to kind of <laughs> relax so i actually sat there with josh and and just talked with him for for a little bit and then brought the bow out and shot a couple arrows but um we we get to the first qualifying day and i mean it, every morning in FIDA for us is pretty calm and the use that stuff yeah. um and you always just expect maybe around half around the, the 36 arrows is when the wind's going to pick up. The wind picked up a little bit, not too bad. We were on the left side of the field, kind of covered by trees. Um, and I just finished out that day with the good score. But then the next day we, I got put on target one cause I was leading the guys. And so they, they peer group after the first day Yeah, and I was in the shade and the, the <laughs> little tree pocket in, in no wind all day on target yeah. one. And it, I, I didn't even shoot as good of a score as I did the first day, but um, I think that's just because the nerves got to me a little bit because uh, I, I knew the world record was close, but yeah, but I, it, I couldn't ask for better conditions there. It was, it was hot and humid. I forget, it was upper eighties. Once you like the difference between shade and sun there was noticeable. And yeah, oh, I did yeah. notice, boy, down there at that one end where you were at, that shade just kept you in there. That was where the longest period of shade was. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but I know when, when we were done shooting, I walked over by 
by the Lancaster trailer and the recurve booth and stuff. I'm like, man, it actually is hot today. I didn't even realize <laughs> yeah. it for the five hours that I've been out here. <laughs> now that tournament, I believe used to be, didn't it used to be split where either recurve or compound shot in the morning and then the other shot in the afternoon, then the next day you would switch. I think so. Yeah. Um, I, now everybody I really shoots it for- once. Right. I haven't been shooting them for too long, so I don't remember okay, that might how been. they used to be. But I think when I started, I think they had juniors and stuff with us. Yes. Yes. So that's, yes. Correct. And I think that's why they had to do some weird scheduling stuff. Yeah. Um, but since they have their own uh, junior Joe Ad Nationals type thing. Um, right. But yeah. It's it's set up pretty pretty easy now. I, I, I Nobody's complaining about the setup now, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody shoots on one line, so there's not a morning and an afternoon session. It's just morning. Um, yeah. But uh, so uh, going into the second day, uh, Fridays, 72 hours, at what point did you realize the world record was in reach? <sighs> I don't want to say I I really thought about it because when I, when I finished, I knew I had it, but I wasn't, I was, I was more thinking of, okay, let's win this event. Um, I, I had maybe with like three ends left, I had like a four point lead, three point lead. And I'm like, okay, I don't want to be that guy that loses that lead in the, in the end and, and have to win on a tiebreaker or even just lose it. So my, my goal was just to extend that as much as I could. So I had a very stress free, uh, last end yeah yeah. um and i i ended up i I hit my last three ends i think i cleaned out i think um but it was i didn't really think about the world record until i after i shot my final arrow i put my bow pot on my bow and i walked back and i'm like okay i got it by two you know that's good enough for me yeah the event (laughs) let's just (laughs) calm down here i got i got worked up for no reason (laughs) but so in that tournament format then that you know, winning that gives you the national championship and then it seeds you for the U S open. You were then the, the number one seed going into head to head matches. That was Saturday, uh, for the U S open, which was what we then televised. Um, and you have said before match play, I mean, as good as you shot in qualifying, you like match play. That's where you feel your strongest suit is. What, tell us about that. Why is that? And what do you like about it? it's more of a mental battle. Um, and even I feel like for most people, it's a mental battle with yourself. Um, I feel like I'm a very strong minded shooter. Um, I don't, I don't let other stuff bother me. Um, at least I try not to. So if I'm, if I'm in control of my own shooting and I'm not worrying about other people, it usually goes pretty well. But if you go out there in a match and you're like, okay, I need this guy to miss three points you know, uh, let me, yeah. let me win. It usually doesn't work out in the, in your favor. <laughs> so I just go out there. If I, I mean, I know when I'm shooting my best, I can, I can beat most people. Um, so when I'm out there and if I'm shooting my best, I know, okay, well this guy with our conditions, it's not, I don't know how to word it correctly, but it's, it, yeah, it's just the mental side of things that I excel at. Um, gotcha. And when, when we're shooting outdoors, I mean, that's, that's my type of shooting anyways. So that's where I feel more, more comfortable. Um, and, and yeah, it's just only 15 arrows. So I can't complain with that either. <laughs> so speaking about the mental side, uh, I just recently, it's interesting within the past week, I saw, I've seen two new videos about how to properly shoot a thumb button. <laughs> and in both of those videos, the people presenting mentioned well, there are some guys who like to punch the trigger. You know, they're talking about how to pull through the shot and all that. And they all say, there are some people who can do it. And some of them can do it well, but most people can't. And I know they're referring to you and Kyle Douglas in particular. Right. You guys <laughs> love to punch that thing. Talk about wh- how, why that is and why it works for you. I mean, if if I've heard Tim Gillingham say, yeah, if you can control it, that is the way to do it. The problem is most people can't. Right. So when I, when I shoot a bow, I I probably have said this before, but, um, I grew up shooting guns, shooting shotguns. So when I shoot a bow, I, I picture it just like that, you know, you're, you're aiming what you're aiming at and you just pull the trigger and, and everything's good. So, I mean, there's a lot, I feel like a lot more that goes into a bow, but as long as you're just doing your thing and letting the machine do itself, it's going to hit where your, where your pin was, at least it should. If not, then you got to 
fix something on the bow. Um, so with, with punching, I mean, it's essentially the same thing to me. I'm, I'm kind of floating around the middle. Um, now I can't hold as steady as, as a lot of the guys out there. And that's why my shots a lot quicker. Um, but I also feel that's why I excel in the wind, um, because I can speed it up, slow it down whenever I need to. Um, and in the wind, nobody's holding steady. So that kind of right. evens that out for me. Um, but yeah, it's just, if you really think about it, it's as clean as it can possibly be. I shoot a very static shot, so I'm not pushing, pulling, putting extra pressure, less pressure. Some shots I'm, it's just a constant factor. My bow is in the same spot every time. Um, and as long as that pins in the middle, when I pull the trigger, um, now obviously everybody hears about target panic and, and I mean, that is a hundred percent serious thing. I never would. I never would teach anybody my way of shooting right. unless I know that they can actually mentally handle it, which you can't really tell if somebody can. No. Right. Um, I've tried teaching Danelle how to punch and it works really <laughs> well for about 15 arrows and then it goes really bad. Um, <laughs> That's my experience with it. When it works, I man, like- I can get it to work, but when it doesn't, it's bad. <laughs> I feel like that's most people. We, I, we were in uh, South Dakota and we were shooting the first qualifying of the first Dakota classic. And I'm sitting back there and I look over and I see Braden shooting a thumb button. I'm like, Whoa. <laughs> and then I, I think I was sitting next to Steph and I'm like, how long do you think this lasts? Because, because Braden's one of those guys that'll tell you it, it, it'll shoot great. But when it, when it stops shooting great, it's, I mean, you're messed up. Yes. And, they did a good nine ends with it. I think it was, it was impressive, but, <laughs> but you really, there's, there's very few people that you can see on the high level with that can punch and punch consistent. And for a long time, yeah. um, I feel like you all, like a lot of times you see these, these younger kids or, I mean, just anybody that switches to punching um, and they get really hot for a short amount of time and just burn out. Um, there's, I mean, but we've all, I, everybody's experienced that little, anticipation um i've done it i know i've seen kyle do it mike schlosser um and we know tim has missed a couple targets before but (laughs) yes (laughs) but if if you the i mean the whole point is you're taking you're taking the bow and everything out of picture and it's just all in your mind at that point um and if you can control that you can you can hit the middle every time so sitting with uh darren christianberry doing the asas he he calls it every time. If Tim has a little flinch and catches it, he's like every time he's like, "Now watch this next one. He's gonna hit it right in the middle." <laughs> and yep. he usually, you know, once if he doesn't, if the bow doesn't go off, he's able to save it. Usually, he can fix it pretty quickly. We we actually had that conversation this past weekend. Um, I, I I mean it, we call it ginches, and it's kind of yeah. when you just come off the back wall a little bit. Well. I, I mean, it happens to me, it happens to Kyle, it happens to Tim. For me, it's mostly if I just get way too relaxed and my bow just wants to go forward. Um, the trick is you don't, you have to train yourself not to shoot the arrow when that happens because it's really easy to just touch that trigger and it goes yep. off. Um, and when we were talking, when Danell tried to punch in Yankton and she shot really good and then had one ginch and it went off and she shot a five <laughs> and we were talking just, that's, that's the difference. You have to control and not be able to shoot it then. Yeah, um, yeah. now for most people, if that happens, you should probably let the bow down, but I know I rarely ever let down and Tim is, we're, we're just comfortable enough where if we ginch, yeah. You know, we just put it right back in the back wall and make a strong shot. It doesn't change much in our shot. Yeah. Um, but, but that's the scary part for most people. And do you, I forget, do you set your trigger? Is it really light? Extremely light. It's yeah. Extremely uh, light. It's, I, right now it's set where I have to tip it upside down to cock it. I have oh, to have the right. weight of the barrel um, to actually set the release. So that's crazy. Wh- which release are you shooting? I'm shooting the True Ball Abyss right now. It's the Abyss. the same release that I shot back in 2019. Um, I pulled it out uh, right before Columbia just to get get with something that I was comfortable with. So yeah, yeah, man, yeah. That uh, I you know I talked to Kyle Douglas about it, and he actually said going to the thumb button, he used to shoot a hinge, and he just kept having dip bangs, and he just couldn't. You know, he wanted something that he could control better. And now, I mean, he says, man, when that thing gets into the middle, he wants it super light so that he can, you know, 
he can touch it off and his brain and his thumb are in conjunction and i'm guessing that's that sounds yeah. like what you do too yeah 100 percent. i know when we were in lancaster in 2020 um i was shooting next to kyle and tim and tim comes up to me he's like you better watch out kyle's punching now and <laughs> And he took, I think Kyle took third actually that year um, in, or no, no, no. He took fourth in Lancaster, but, and then I think he's won every Vegas since, except for this last one and yeah. won every internationals. I mean, he's just a machine. So he figured out the indoor game, which I, I'm still trying to, but right, right. I got up outdoor game down. So, yeah, it's interesting, you know, hearing guys like you talk about that with the punching, cause you know, the, the common thread is ah don't punch that's bad for you and stuff like that but yet i mean three outdoor target championships in a row you've won them all you know kyle and all his indoor stuff it's like so two of the best shooters that we see right now do the same thing <laughs> which is what everybody tells you not to do <laughs> and kyle took second at both of the shoots in south dakota last week so oh right I mean, it, right it it's I, it's by far the most consistent type of shooting. If you're trying yeah. to break arrows and have good groups, do that. But I mean, I would never tell somebody to do it if if I know that they're going to have issues with it. Yeah, because um, it can be it can be amazing or it can be the worst thing ever for somebody for some people. So how about that? So all right. So going to NFA now, outdoor uh, target nationals. That one is outside. That's a forty, fifty, sixty yard shoot. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. And you shoot 30 at each, 20 at each? I forget. Uh, you shoot 20 at each the first day and then 30 at each the second day. Oh, okay. Uh, that one's yep. a two-day as well. So yep. tell me about that one. Uh, South Dakota, I picture it being windy, but I don't know if that's what it was. It, I mean, that's what everybody expected. Um, it really wasn't that bad. Um, there was, in the later part of the round, the wind would pick up just like it does anywhere. And you basically just have to time it. Um, you could hear it coming, and then, I mean, you'll, it's kind of fun to watch when you're standing there on the line, you hear the wind and all of a sudden you see 20 people let down and just sit there, wait. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't incredibly windy. Um, that's the, it wasn't, I guess it was kind of hot, but it wasn't terrible. You know, it was probably the best outdoor weather I've had in Yankton for sure. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And now for that one, what order do you shoot? Do you shoot the close ones first or last? So the, the first day you shoot, you start at 40 and shoot your 20, go back to 50. Um, and that's on the 92 centimeter face. Okay. And then, which is, I think we, we shoot an 80 centimeter for FETA. So it's a little bit bigger face. Oh, okay. Um, and then the second day we start at 60 and move forward, but we start on the 122 centimeter face. It's the recurve feet of face. Right. So it's a little weird after, after 60, the second day. Um, I don't, I don't think any of us on the, on our bail the second day missed at 40 or 50. Okay. So after 60, after the first 30 arrows, the second day, we kind of knew how it was going to end up. Um, right. And then at that point you have 60 arrows just to not make a mental mistake um, and, and do something that you shouldn't. Um, anybody bigger can miss face. 60, but, yeah. Bigger yeah. face than you're shooting at a farther distance, 50 meters. Obviously that's 57 ish yards. Um, yep. So at 40 and 50, you're shooting an even bigger face than that. Right. And, and actually it, the, the most difficult part for me was keeping enough arrows in the quiver. Um, the second day we all shoot at the big recurve face, but we all shoot on the same target. Oh, wow. Well, there's me, Braden, Kyle Douglas, and <laughs> Jacob Pettit just smashing <laughs> each other's arrows. Um, and I, I didn't have, I didn't bring that many arrows to begin with. And cause I totally forgot about that second day of that event. Yeah. Um, but I mean, there, there's a couple times where the guys were nice. I mean, Kyle, Kyle shot around the X a couple times and, <laughs> and we all tried to help each other out. But, once, once it got down to 40, they're, they're like, okay, Jimmy, we're aiming at your arrows now because <laughs> I'm not likely to miss at 40. So yeah. they need to try to break my arrows so I can't finish. <laughs> but, but no, it's, it's kind of, it's a weird event, but it's fun. So, yeah. So how many would you feel comfortable? How many arrows would you feel comfortable having? Do you think you need? Oh, I, I went there <clears throat> with 11 and I finished with seven. I had okay. one backup arrow and it actually, my backup arrow had uh, one of Tate's knocks on it. Cause I didn't have any knocks cause I just was unprepared. <laughs> so I, I put one of Tate's knocks, which are completely different 
color and size and shape and everything is my Knox. I shot it at 60 in the practice round and it hit right next to my other arrows. So if, I mean, if I needed to, I could have used it. And with NFA, I think you can use two different color Knox, but, but yeah, um, that oh, yeah, I ended up with one extra arrow over the, over the weekend. It was a little scary, but <laughs> jeez. So coming up now you have, I forget which you have two tournaments yet. I forget what they are. Yep. Um, World Cup final in October in Mexico, and then the Pan Am Championships oh, in Chile in November. Pan Am Championships. Okay. So, yeah, so World Cup final. So that's there's only eight people in the world who get to go to that. You yep. got there. You had to qualify. You won. I forget which stage you won this year. Uh, stage four, Columbia. In Columbia. Okay. Yep. And so if you win, you're automatically in um, uh, one of the events, and then they have the point system for the others, I believe. Um, yep. how do you feel about that? Uh, world cup final is that's not one you've won yet. I have not. No. Okay. That's, that's kind of the, the super bowl for the FIDA season. Yeah. Um, the, the, I won the world championships in 2019, that's which it. is, I mean, the world cup final world championships are like the two biggest, they go hand in hand really. Yeah. Um, but the world cup final is where the majority of the money is, um, it's way more, uh, there's only eight people. So it's, it's just, it's even harder to get there. Um, right. So it, it, it's a, it's a huge event and it's, it's the one that I want to win to, to feel like I've accomplished everything that I wanted to in FIDA. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm going to be shooting for as long as I can think still. So uh, there's going to be other chances, but yeah. I'm, I'm in good form right now. I'm, I'm shooting great. The, I, I just, hope hope this is the year but it's it's my type of shooting um I, I love matches i love outdoor matches so um i mean i could go there and it could be 15 arrows and i'm done yeah but um i think you said that has happened to you before yep yeah i uh, 2019 in russia i went there um it, it was kind of a rough trip i wasn't I, I think i was sick with something i wasn't feeling great um i get there shoot 15 bad arrows and and was done so Man. i just don't want to do that again because <laughs> because the format for this one is there's no qualification you go straight into match play yep yeah i mean they they do the one and two seed which i think is mike and uh either matthias or uh john philippe bolsch um they're on the opposite sides of the bracket and then they draw names and that's that's just how you get chosen who you shoot so we don't know who we shoot against until the night before we shoot yeah gotcha um yeah so okay so you go into world cup final obviously as you said that's what you like the match play do you get nervous going into that or is it more excitement um i, I would say more excitement now um I, I mean back in when i when i first started the stuff in 2019 my first metal match in turkey i i don't even remember it i mean i was so nervous <laughs> i was shaking so bad we were out standing in on the mediterranean sea with the sun just beating down i don't remember anything to, to be honest um but and then the more just the more experience i got the better the better that was um now i i feel a little nerves but more it's just adrenaline when i get out there yeah um, and I, usually I can, I can put more weight on my bars right before I go out there because I'm just going to be bouncing around a little bit more. Cause I'm the, the adrenaline. I can just, I feel like I can just hold up so much more weight. Right. So that's, that's the biggest thing for me that I have to control is the adrenaline. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, it's probably nerves in there too, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's nerves. Um, right. I, I, I'm not, I feel like when you're nervous, you're almost scared and I, I don't feel scared when I'm out there. Um, and that's, I, th I think that's a big thing of why I like matches as well, because sure. I, I let the adrenaline and the nerves help me instead of make me scared or make weak shots. But yeah. So you like this, uh, feed a game and, you know, shooting for USA archery. Um, if we see one of the major, um, archery tournament styles shrinking a little bit in compound that's probably it but you like it why do you like that and you know what would you say to encourage more people to get into that yeah um i like i like wind i like unknown conditions really um i i, I feel like the most fun shooting for me is at a long distance and 
I mean, other than writing, which is once a year, that's and field that's going to be my chance to shoot that long distance. Um, it's just it's a lot more of a challenge than than indoors as far as hitting the middle. Um, but it's it's just a fun time because you're you're out there shooting a long distance in wind. You know, not every shot I'm aiming in the middle. Sometimes I have to aim left or right depending on wind. Right. Um, it's more of a it's a little bit more strategy than indoors um just because of that of the weather but and and it it brings in the the matches which i like to do and every every feed ends with matches so um it's it's an extremely good way to get you prepared for every other type of shooting too because if you're tied in a match going into your one arrow shoot off i mean that's the most nerves you're going to feel until you're in the shoot off at the, in the Vegas shoot or something. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's really good preparation for every other type of shooting as well. And if you want to represent the country, I mean, that's what you got to shoot pretty much. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that's, that's kind of why I got into it. You know, I thought it would be cool to, to travel with the United States um, and shoot, represent the United States. And I mean, it's an honor getting that Jersey every year and, and being able to go tons of different places in the world and, and wear the Jersey. Um, and that's, I mean, that's just basically a bonus to it. Um, yeah. uh, I, I think we had talked before, you hadn't done much traveling before this, before you got into oh, this yeah. game. I, before, before I got into FIDA, I didn't really ever leave the state. Um, I, I, I went to Vegas to shoot, I think once, and then, you know, fishing trips or whatnot to Illinois or Minnesota, but that's it really. That's um, it. I didn't, I didn't travel much at all. Um, but and I, I do like traveling. Um, yeah. It's it's very tiring, but it, I mean, being able to see new places is is cool. You can never complain with that. So yeah, and of course, through archery, you met your wife Danelle. She has she shoots FIDA as well, and I believe you both qualified for the 2023 USA team. Yep. Yeah. She she used to shoot for South Africa. She uh, she's from South Africa. Um, I met her in Turkey, and she we got married last year. And this last year was her, you have to take a year off from competition. So it was oh, her gotcha. year off. Um, she shot worlds in Yankton um, and then took her year off. So um, this year she qualified for the United States team for next year. So it'll be awesome. She will, she'll get to travel to the world cups with us. Um, yeah. It'll be, I'm sure it'll be a little, a little weird seeing her in an American Jersey. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, I'm super excited. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome for her to be able to see the world again. And, and I know in, in South Africa, they, they didn't have the greatest funding and whatnot for their shooters. Um, luckily here, um, when we go to a world cup, us air tree pays for it. So, yeah. um, it'll be nice. She'll be able to see way more places, um, just be able to shoot her bow and, and we will be able to get to do it together. So that's, that's going to be fun. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah, that's cool. So World Cup final, that's on your to-do list uh, to win that one. What else is out there on the Jimmy Lutz have to-do list yet? Um, I, was, I mean, one of the indoor shoot-offs. I, I haven't made one of those. Um, that's that's one of my goals, and it always will be. Um, it's just the indoor game I, I haven't figured out mentally yet. Um, but... I, I think I made some good progress this past year. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I, I know it's probably, you hear everybody say it gets easier once you make the first one. I, I'm not, that puts more pressure on making that first one to me. So I'm just going to try to go out there um, and shoot, shoot my bow and just pretend it's outdoors, I guess. But making one of the indoor shoot offs is, is probably right. my main goal. Yeah. You've made the Lancaster Archery Classic finals, but there again, that's match play. Yeah. That's match play. So, which, I mean, I love Lancaster Classic. That's probably the most excited I get in uh, in indoors. But um, but yeah, those those shoots where you you have to be perfect for six hours for two days in a row, three days in a row. You know, that's just mentally draining <laughs> on me. Um, and it just it takes a long time. I don't know if I if I probably stop complaining about it and, and start enjoying <laughs> it, then I'll probably shoot better. So. <laughs> But. So, well, in a year like this, where you have the Pan American Championships in November, I mean, indoor starts basically in December. Um, yeah, I know the Rushmore Rumble is yeah. that like the second weekend of December. Right. So we're in we're in Chile 
the week over Thanksgiving. So it's the end of November. Right. So okay. I'm, I mean, I'm going to have two weeks to get home, get an indoor bow and, <laughs> and head out to Yankton again. Um, but, but that'll probably be good for me. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll still kind of be in, in the outdoor mindset for the most part. And, you know, it, usually if you, if you're shooting outdoors for a while and then you go shoot indoors, it just looks a lot closer. It feels easier to do for uh, a little okay. bit of time at least. Yeah. Um, so maybe that'll be good for me. Uh, we'll see. I, I never really thought I'd be somewhere shooting outdoors in the end of November, but yeah. kind of excited for it. Yeah. Um, do you normally like take a break and okay, I'm not picking up a target bow, you know, in the month of November or something like that. Obviously you're from Wisconsin, so I'm sure you're deer hunting. Right. Yeah. I, I normally take a break. I don't, I wouldn't say I practice like most people do either. Um, All right. so it's not, uh, Danelle, she practices, I mean, if she's, if she's in season, she's going to try to shoot as much as she can every single day. Yeah. Um, I don't practice that much. I probably should, but I don't. Um, but yeah, I'll, I mean, I'm not going to pick my bow up until October 1st to get ready for the finals. Um, hunting season starts the 17th or 18th here. Um, so that'll give me a little bit of time in the woods. Um, the boat's getting fixed right now. That should be done, but we'll be, uh, we'll be out on the lake uh, for most of the time. And, and I'm working a lot. I've been staying pretty busy. So um, doing what? I, I, that was what I wanted to ask you. I don't know. Do you I, do something besides archery? I, I work for Darton Black Eagle and Conquest. Um, oh, okay. Uh, I'm a regional rep. So um, anybody in basically the Midwest States and a couple outsiders, um, I, I talk to all the dealers and stuff, but. Gotcha. What do you hear from them about, you know, Conquest is a brand up and coming. Obviously, they see all the top shooters shooting that. What do you hear from dealers when they're, you know, when you're bringing a new brand like that? It's not new now, but when you started. Um, right. So it's it's a little weird because we'll have we'll have shops because arrows are the biggest for us. Black Eagle is by yeah. far bigger. Um, they're in tons and tons of shops. And you'll have dealers that you'll go show them stabilizers and say, yeah, I mean, we're with Black Eagle and Conquest, and and they'll have no clue that we had anything to do with stabilizers. <laughs> yeah. Um. And I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard of a dealer that has worked with Randy and not wanted to continue working with Randy. Right. So that's that's one of the biggest things. We're we're really good with the dealers at Dart and Black Eagle and Conquest. Um. That's our main thing. I mean, if they're not doing so, if they're not doing well, then we're not doing well. Um, so we're trying to help out all the, all the dealers, all the small mom and pop shops and stuff. Um, but it's, it's definitely a challenge with the bows. Um, they're, they're a lot, a lot bigger of a purchase than, than some stabilizers are for dealers. Um, getting, I mean, it helps having black Eagle there already yeah. for sure. Um, but now that people are actually, putting the bows against other bows and, and seeing the success on the target side of things, which not a lot of dealers necessarily pay attention to target or right. care about target. Um, but there's some, there's some that do and that, that makes it a lot easier on that side of things. Um, but, but yeah, once, once the dealers, I mean, everybody, everybody up by me, I'm in Wisconsin. So, I mean, every dealer by us has Matthews in their shop. So it's really, oh, right. it's, it's almost impossible to get, <laughs> to get, a different bow company in their shops, which I mean, it's a home home grown company or whatever. I yeah. completely understand it. So, I mean, there's, there's a kind of a level of stubbornness with people that they don't want to try a new thing or they just want to stick with their brand. And I, I understand that. I mean, that's how I am with Darton. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to try any other stuff. So, um, <laughs> but, but once people put one bow against another, I mean, they understand, okay, this is the real deal. Um, and when people start looking at prices and stuff, I mean, it's just a lot, it makes, it makes sense. So we ju we just need to get bows in people's hands and, and they can understand that they're great shooting bows. It's funny. We love it when somebody comes into the shop and they're like, I am buying this and I am not buying this, you know, A and B, they got it. And we're like, well, you know, just why not shoot them all? What do you got to lose? We got them all here, shoot them all. And it's funny how often they'll, the one they said they would never shoot, they end up shooting. They're like, man, I, I kind of like it. <laughs> right. Absolutely. <laughs> and it's, especially this industry, I, I feel people are really clicky almost. Um, they, they do their own thing and never, never try anything else. And, right. um, 
I, I feel like that's changing a little bit more though, because there's so many different products out now. Um, there's hundreds of different types of arrows yeah. and stuff. People are finding what they like. And well, I mean, we're, we're just trying to make, make the bows to what everybody likes, what people like. And I feel like people are very surprised and, and excited when they actually shoot one. Well, that's the thing. It's, you know, cause I do the reviews here for all, for all the Lancaster bows that come in and I do all the flagship ones. Everybody's like, ah, you know, you always say you love them all. And I mean, those top end flagship bows, there's not going to be a bad one. You know, one that's like, exactly. oh, this thing, this thing stinks. So you can't shoot anything with that. You know, there may be little intricacies that one person likes over another, but they're all good bows. The yep. Darton bows, they're good bows. It's just somebody has to try them to to realize it. And right. like you said, that's the part. And it is, we're seeing that more and more that more people are trying them and getting yeah, into them. Absolutely. It, which is cool. No, it's, it, I mean, I'm way bigger on the target side of things. I don't necessarily hunt a ton. So I, when I, I mean, and every shoot this year, it, it seems like that I've gone to every one has more and more dart and shooters as the previous one. Yeah. Um, we went to three or four of the ASAs this year, which we normally don't go to many of those. And it was kind of crazy to see how many people actually were shooting dartons compared to the USATs when me and Danella were typically the only ones at USATs. Right. Um, right. But it's, it's cool to see the growth. Um, I mean, when I, before this, I don't think I ever saw a Darton other than my dad's dusty one hanging up in the garage. <laughs> That's about right. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's, it's crazy to see where, where Randy has brought this in two years. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That is cool. So, okay. So you're not shooting, you're not practicing with your bow. What's Jimmy Lutz doing uh, away fishing. from archery? Fishing. <laughs> yep. You live in Wisconsin. Of course, that's it. You probably can turn around and throw a rock in any direction and probably hit awesome fishing, I would imagine. Easily. Yeah, we uh, we, we live on a lake. We, we bought a house right on the lake here. Oh, um, no kidding. The fishing isn't amazing here, um, but it's, it's I mean, it's fishing. It's You don't have to catch fish to have fun. But um, we, we figure out the lake a little bit. Um, and we go pretty much every night, um, right now the boat's in the shop. So we got a couple of days off of fishing, but right at, right when work's done, I, I go walk out of my office and then I was like, well, you ready? Let's go on the boat. And I'll look out the window and the dog's already sitting in the boat. So, um, no, we, we spend the majority of our time on the water. Um, and especially this off season, then not going to shoot a bow for a while. I'm not going to look at a bow for a week or two and, and we'll be out on the water. What do you get? I'm jealous of that, man. That drives me nuts. <laughs> what, what are you fishing for mostly right near you? Uh, bass and we, we get a lot of pike in our lake, um, okay. but mainly we go for bass um, yeah. anywhere we go. Um, the, I feel like the pike have kind of overrun our lake now, but it's, I mean, it's still fun catching pike, but. Always. Um, They're so yeah. aggressive. <laughs> Oh yeah. There's, yeah. As, we got, we have a really shallow lake, so it's kind of, it's kind of a weird one to fish. Um, ah, okay. but there's, I mean, there's lakes all around us that go 200 feet deep. So it's not a big deal. We just buzz the boat over there and, and go fishing there. But, yeah. um, if we're just going for a, for an hour or two at night, we're mainly just catching bass and pike. There's something to be said for close. I mean, living on the lake, just to be able to just go out the door and fish. Like you said, it doesn't have to be the best in the world. It's right there. Right. <laughs> our our house actually, we have a boat garage underneath. So under our Come living room, you you can you can pull in two 16 foot bass boats oh, or man. John boats or whatever. But yeah, we can. I mean, we could we f could fish bluegill right out the window if we want. No kidding. It's yeah, that that's close. Cool. Yeah, it's completely over the water for <laughs> maybe like 18, 20 feet over the water. So. No kidding. Jeez. That's awesome. <laughs> it, it's good for ice fishing because you can just watch TV and look out the window at your at your tip-ups. So. <laughs> do you do much of that? Ice fishing? What? That's like extreme oh, yeah. sports I think of. When I... well, you got to do it like we do it. We we have the big camper ice shacks with TVs and and yeah. heaters in it and we just go sit out there and play cards and and watch tip ups <laughs> cuz you we yeah your ice probably gets thick enough that you can drive on it oh yeah yeah we'll have uh, i feel like even late november sometimes we'll have cars trucks on the on the ice we'll get that early 
three feet of ice sometimes, um, wow. four feet of ice in some places. So, but yeah, we, we're driving on the ice where we, we've got ice drag racing by us. <laughs> Um, people bring out their their beater cars and just try to drag race on ice. It's yeah, it's just a it's a lifestyle. <laughs> I'm sure that just made Kyle, our video producer, perk up. He's nodding his head. Yes, he likes <laughs> he likes the thought of that right. <laughs> drag racing on the ice. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a video of it and put it on Facebook next time we do it. <laughs> All right, folks, that is another episode of the Competition Archery Media Podcast. Jimmy Lutz, we, uh, first, congratulations on your victories you've had. We appreciate your time today, and we wish you the best of luck with your last two tournaments this year. Thank you guys so much for having me. All right, folks, the CAM Podcast, you can find it on all the platforms where you find your favorite podcast. Thanks for joining us today.